the Victoria uh, and Albert Museum, uh, looking at which is the right yardstick to choose. Cathy. Thank you. So, um, I'm not actually a researcher, I'm not an academic, so I'm feeling something of an imposter to even be here talking about research today. Um, what I am is the Head of Digital Media and Publishing at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And in case you don't know it, uh, the v &A is in South Kensington. We have over a million objects in our collection, so um, I can chat to you all about our digitization woes. Um, we also have um, many miles of galleries, and we have everything from 5,000 years of human creativity. Now, we've been involved in a number of projects, uh, lots of digital projects, some funded by the HLF. And we found there are lots of different tools, different yardsticks you can use um, in evaluating and measuring the success and the impact of those projects. So I'd like to just share a few examples with you today. In fact, I need my presentation first, so. <laughs> This should be easy. And it should be there. That's Sorry, it. I do apologise. Don't I didn't worry. Say I'll load that up for you. Don't worry. There we go. It's all there. So, um, I think there are really three key things that come to mind when I think about measuring, measuring and measurement. Um, firstly, is what we're measuring. Now, if I can put that actually into presentation view. That's a bit prettier. Um, first off, we think, what are you measuring? So um, we don't just look at what that product, pro product is, um, but actually, what are the elements within that product that you want to measure? Um, also, crucially, and I'm going to dwell on this in a little more detail shortly, when in the process are you going to be measuring and evaluating? That is a key thing that we've touched on a few times today, and I'm going to go into a bit more depth on that. And most importantly, why? and to what end? Is it because Karen would like to know as part of her evalu your evaluation of the project she's funded or some other sponsor? Um, yes, of course, it's important to uh, respond to funders' needs to evaluate, but also it's crucial that you're measuring and evaluating as you go, um, not just for the funders' um, needs, but also for the people who are using the products. They're actually the most important people at the end of the day. So typically, um, projects follow a waterfall process. Um, waterfall process involves various stages. They should all be familiar to you. Um, you capture your requirements and then you go on to design and then you look at implementation and then a bit of testing. And during the maintenance stage, you then look at evaluation. So um, that's a very sort of classic way of approaching things. Um, there's nothing inherently long with that, wrong with that, but this ends up being quite a protracted, um, well, often periods of months, if not years, by the time you evaluate. The issue we have here is that if you leave evaluation and measuring till the end, there's every likelihood that you find out you built the wrong thing to start with. So instead, we use a process called Agile, and I'm sure lots of you are familiar with that. Agile methodology um, doesn't just look at evaluation at the end, but there is various different aspects to measuring and measurement. You have exploration, you have different types of measurements around evaluating at each stage and around validating and testing your assumptions and continually measuring as you go along. So the R's here uh, relate to different releases. So within Agile, you're releasing early. You're building the smallest thing you can and releasing early. In that release, you have a small cycle of discovery, of design, developing, and test. You then put it out to the public at large, even if it's a bit clunky and a bit embarrassing. It doesn't matter because at least you get it into the hands of people who matter the most, the users. You then find out some stuff from the way they use it, and that goes into your next release and your next release. And this is a gradual um, iteration, iterated, iterative process. Um, and the end of this, you might actually decide to sunset your product. And that's something we probably haven't talked enough about today, about killing things off, uh, whether they're successful or not, actually planning for the end of your project or product, as we say in the Agile word. The great thing about this process is that you are getting loads of insight very early on. It means that you are, by releasing that smallest thing, you're learning lots early on to then inform the ongoing development. So what does that look like? Well, if your um, 
project is about finding a way to get people from A to B with the use of uh, wheels, uh, you might take this sort of approach in waterfall. You start off with one wheel, then you add another, and then you add the chassis, and then eventually you get to the car at the end of it. And if you're lucky, you'll get some happy users. But you have to wait a long time to get to the point of building a car. However, with Agile, you've got a much more efficient process that is also much more user-centered. You've got the smallest thing you can possibly launch, which is a skateboard. That will tell you a hell of a lot of uh, things about the way people use your product. And it could be that a skateboard is all you need. And I think lots of us in this room have probably been guilty of trying to build cars when actually we should have been building skateboards all along. The great thing about this is that you're learning with each point in the process. And yes, you might end up with the same product, but you'll end up with a hell of a lot more knowledge and insight into how your users behave to get to this point. So as we all know, what people say is different from what they do. So even if we do involve people in this user-centered design approach and early on in the process, how do we even know if and when to, to act on what they say? Well, there's an interesting framework that we started looking at. It's from um, a chap at Nielsen called Christian Rohrer. And this is a really simple uh, matrix that can help you understand what tools to use to answer different research questions in the process. So we do have the what people do at the top there and what people say. So what people say is qualitative and what people do is behavioral. And then you've got different research questions. Uh, the research will ultimately, if it's... Um, on the left-hand side, uh, where it's uh, much more qualitative, you will have people who, people are answering, helping you answer the question, why and how can you fix this product? And on the other side, you've got the sort of much bigger data around how people are engaging with things, how many and how much. So this is an interesting framework. What, do, what are the techniques? You can actually plot them on this axis, but I've just um, listed them out. You can cluster them around behavioral and attitudinal. Now, I know, as I said, I'm not a researcher, but the research I do is mainly in user experience, and there are all kinds of other research um, uh, techniques that I could share here, but these are some of the ones we use regularly. And they do very much sit in these two camps of behavioral and attitudinal. And um, things like ethnographic research does uh, neatly straddle both. Um, but we've been doing very small amounts of testing on a number of products that sit within these different types of um, research methods. And we're finding that different tools are appropriate at different stages in the process and for different products. So I want to take you through three of those examples um, and show you where in the sort of process that we, we uncovered these findings and did this research. So the first one here is around some discovery work we did as part of the build of our new website. Um, it was a project that actually saw us build a new website and content management in system in four months. And we did a huge amount of discovery prior to that. And we dug into some audience behavior data. We firstly looked at Google Analytics and we also looked at um, data from our market research. So there's two interesting sets of data there. And this was just a mapping of online behaviors. It's not to do with segmentations, uh, marketing segmentations, uh, to do with a physical audience. In fact, there's a complementary uh, relationship between the two. Um, and these aren't sort of absolutes um, in terms of how we define people. People can move around this matrix depending on their own motivations and behaviors. So on one axis, you've got discovery and intent. So on the left, you've got people who may have never heard of the VNA or have just encountered us online. And on the right, you've got intent, which is people who actually want to come down to the museum next Tuesday afternoon. Um, on this axis, the uh, vertical axis, you've got deep engagement and quick engagement. And quick is not necessarily bad. Sometimes people just want to find out the opening times. So um, if they nip, dip in and out, that's no bad thing. Um, you have people who are there to explore and rummage through lots of content who are characterized by high dwell times, lots of pages per session, etc. cetera. Um, so we started classifying these folks. So the people who have high intent and deep engagement, well, they're your enthusiasts. They're your loyal followers. They're probably likely to be members of the VNA. Uh, they want to find different opportunities to participate. So they're looking at particular areas of our online presence. They're looking at what's on our events listings, um, and particularly around uh, deeper ways of engaging, like through our adult learning courses, for example. And then we have our general visitors. 
they're people who are wanting to come to the museum. So they just need some quick visitor-focused information. A small but growing bunch of people are inspiration seekers and they're really looking for um, interesting tidbits online. These are people who might not even have heard of the V&A but they have their interest peaked often through social media channels where they find our content. For example, collections content on Pinterest or interesting Reddit threads. So there's inspiration seekers. They are a small group, but they're quite fascinating. And then we've got researchers who are a core, a very important group. They might actually, that's to say they're all important. Uh, they, they obviously, <laughs> they obviously uh, might also be general visitors. They might also be enthusiasts, but typically our researchers may be more remote. Um, they will be uh, often more present and uh, visible online when they're in that research mode. Um, and they're looking uh, through long articles. We can see when we do content performance tests, they're the sort of people that might scroll right to the bottom of a very long article. They might be looking at very many pages in one session. So what do they look like? Well, these are the relative sizes. Um, overwhelmingly, people are on our website to uh, plan a visit to the museum. Next up, we've got people who are in research mode, and they may or may not be academic researchers. These might be people looking at stuff for their GCSE projects, as well as people who are doing um, a PhD. We've got then the enthusiasts, so the loyal core followers who will come back again and again and again to the website, and then the people who are just coming in, possibly for the first time, often referred through social media. So it was in doing this piece of research as part of the discovery phase for our website that we realised um, it helped define the purpose of our website because there were long, hard debates over what on earth it was there for and lots of very valid reasons why our website should exist and for whom. But this gave us a very good focus. And with Agile a methodology, you're ruthlessly prioritising all the time. And this gave us a really good, clear focus to say, is this driving more visits? Whatever we were doing, whatever content we were building, whatever features we were developing, is this ticking the box of somebody who's in that behaviour mode where they're looking for stuff to inspire them, to prompt them to the museum? So this then informed um, the actual the website build. It helped us prioritise all the stuff we needed to do. We were constantly prioritising around uh, the general visitor. But we also um, were thinking about how to help make that leap from being an online visit to a, a museum visit in the flesh. So we were thinking about content and thinking about imagery and how to make that transition as seamless as possible. So this has now gone on to be used as a framework for all kinds of things, not just our website development, but also in terms of exhibition content that we're pulling together. We're thinking about these different modes people can be in and what content we can package up to them to respond to those different modes and behaviours. Next up, um, we have a very small project we've just done. Um, which was just to show a, a typical project that might happen at this stage, at the design stage, where we've done some remote usability testing for a new section of the website, um, What's On. We currently have um, quite a large section called What's On. It's, um, it's, don't look it up, it's quite ugly, it doesn't work very well, but we're sorting that out. Um, and we had an interesting um, series of debates and discussions. We basically were looking to validate uh, whether we, well, A, whether we needed um, a search box in the first place because controversially we uh, launched our new website without a search box because when we looked at all the data, it showed that most people use this brilliant tool called Google and didn't need an internal site search and so we would have spent a huge amount of back-breaking work making that work and not actually build the website. So we prioritised, descoped. Um, the site search, but we know that for what's on, the product owner, because we've got this product culture now at the V&A, the product owner for what's on said, we would like to keep search in what's on. And we could see the rationale for that, um, but we wanted to validate if and how people used that search. And so we wanted to do a bit of qualitative testing, um, and so we ended up doing um, some remote testing which used only five users. Now, Internally, that was quite interesting, that people found that quite shocking, that you could get useful data from only speaking to five people who were the other side of the world who you didn't even have eyeball contact with. But the fact is, and there's some interesting articles about this, that you, you actually get through 80% of the insights you're ever going to derive by looking at five people. And so let's say you've got budget and time for 15 people. 
actually you're better off running a series of three tests with five people because on each of those tests you'll do some changes and improvements in between and then eventually you'll refine the project product far quicker than you would have done had you gone for a much bigger sort of test. Now obviously we needed to be careful in framing the, the questions in a certain way and making sure that we were um, not uh, leading too much with any of the questions and it made them made sure they understood that this is a clickable prototype, it wasn't the finished thing, but we just simulated a scenario where we wanted people to try and find something that wasn't immediately obvious and see if they could find the search box. Ultimately, we were less sure about the search because we thought the primary purpose of doing what we've done with What's On is to enable discoverability. This is about people browsing through events. If they know an event already exists, they're more likely to use Google. So we thought the most important thing we could do here was surface content. But we then needed a bit of a safety net if somebody had a feeling that there was something where they don't know the exact details of the event, where they might have thought, I know there's somebody famous talking, but I can't remember who it is or what it's on or what day it's on, that the search box might actually provide a bit of guidance in that situation. And we find, found out that people did find it useful. So we've um, incorporated a small um, search box. I would point out that this is quite rudimentary search, and it is there as a safety net, because we're thinking by putting in a small feature, this is the skateboard of search, basically. By putting in a small feature like this, we then get a lot of data that we can then decide how, if and how to improve that search for the rest of what's on. <laughs> so of course we also made sure it's um, responsive on mobile and we queued up some interesting discussions there about where exactly that search should take place on desktop versus mobile and I can tell you all about that if you wish to know more details. Um, Lastly, I'd like to share with you um, a couple of pieces of research we did during the develop phase um, within the Agile process. And this was for the Europe Audio Guide, which was generously supported by the HLF as part of the revamping of our Europe galleries. They cover Europe, the history of material culture across Europe from 1600 to 1815. And we did two phases of um, research. One was some concept testing and one was some uh, guerrilla testing. So the concept testing um, actually took part with uh, Alison from uh, Frankly Green and Webb and they really helped us understand um, what we were doing wrong, if I'm brutally honest, because uh, as is often the way with um, uh, bids to funders, you are in a position where you'd like to scope out what this thing might be and paint a picture of what it can do and might, in the, in the end, inadvertently tie ourselves up with commitments that aren't necessarily um, the most logical from a user perspective. So um, before I'd started, people had had a very noble ambition to make a multimedia guide and that it might be location aware and be using um, location aware technologies to drive people around the galleries. But it was actually through the research that Alison and the team did that we found that that wasn't the most valuable proposition to people. So what we found really useful was, um, this is a reworking of some of your original work, Alison, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, what they did was help us visualize uh, these barriers, these hurdles. So if you imagine a person coming into a gallery on the left-hand side and somebody holding and using and loving a digital product on the other side, these are the various hurdles they need to um, jump over. And they are hurdles of various different sizes, of course. Um, firstly, they need to know it's there. And that seems blindingly obvious. <laughs> but it's, it was certainly a problem for us uh, that we hadn't really made people aware enough of the Europe Audio Guide. It wasn't visible as part of the broader experience of being in the galleries. That's now sorted out. We've improved lots of the signposting for the product. Um, but actually, from some evaluative research we've just done, we found out it's 40% awareness, and okay, that could be better, but people have decided, small amount of people have decided to take up the product. So actually, people are getting over that first hurdle, which is great, and they understand the service. We've, since this um, concept testing, we've actually refined it from what was quite a bloated product. It was almost like a kitchen sink product. Everything was chucked in, there were videos, there's all kinds of content. But people wanted a heads-up experience. They didn't want to be mediating their experience of all these incredible objects, and they really are incredible objects, through their device. They needed to see what, what was going to make them get their 
device out their pocket and use it within the gallery, it certainly wasn't just loads, loads more content. And I think that's often a risk of digital products and projects that they're seen as buckets that you just shove more content in because you can't fit it on the walls or in the cases. So we basically refined it right down as a result of the work we did uh, to an audio guide because that was ultimately where people saw the most value. Um, people didn't see the value of uh, videos and the location aware side of things in terms of the technology, we realized actually people just needed a bit of signposting. We didn't need some overblown technology that was still in its infancy at the time. And whilst it still is, presents quite an interesting opportunity for us and that product at that point in time, it didn't feel like the right choice. So eventually um, we've got to the point where we can see that people know things exist, uh, they understand what it does, what it is, and they're actually compelled to use it, um, and they are able to use it. I'm going to come on to the next bit about some of the usability issues um, and making sure it works, and then really tackling uh, the fact that it needs to have value. So for us, with this product, by turning it into something really small, and just focused on audio, we actually catered better for people's needs than something that was much bigger. I'm going to whiz through some guerrilla testing we did. So having refined it right down to uh, being an audio guide, we, because we work in a museum, we're really, really lucky um, because we can just pop out to the galleries whenever we want and talk to people, and that's such a valuable thing to be able to do. So we did a lot of guerrilla testing, and we found out some really interesting things, like unanticipated um, user behaviours. So, for example, people, you know, people were very positive about this and they liked the fact that it wasn't an on-the-rails experience, that they could actually choose what to listen to and where and when. And then there was interesting behavioural stuff that emerged, like uh, a couple... Uh, sorry, this is about people thinking it's more like a, a treasure hunt, but there was also um, people who were actually listening to it out loud as a couple um, and sharing the device between the two of them, which was um, quite a nice romantic moment in the Europe galleries. But um, they saw value as something that actually enabled a social experience when lots of the, lots of the time people think of audio guides as quite anti-social experiences. Um, we also found out um, stuff like you know, spelling mistakes. That was a problem. People don't know how to spell stuff that's in the galleries and we'd need to have some good search in here. Um, we were also, because we weren't using location-aware technologies, people found it a little bit... Oops, sorry. Mustn't gesticulate. Um, people got a bit um, confused about um, how the images could actually help them on the way, but actually once they'd spotted what this um, feature was about, they saw that they were able to find where the next point on the trail was. So... Um, we also found other stuff like people not finding rewind, etc. So it was a really, really small, minute details at this point. Having done the concept testing with Frankly Green and Web to then be able to do something that was much more tactical around the smaller features in the product and really refine it into what it is today. So that is a whirlwind uh, view over three projects and the different types of research we've undertaken at different stages in the process. Um, I mean, we've learned a huge amount on the way, and I think, you know, we, what we would say is just not to wait till your evaluation reports, important and fundamental as they are, um, you need to be monitoring performance um, along the way. You need to be thinking about how you're going to get data and derive insights at every point in the journey. And Agile process is a brilliant way to do that because it means you're finding things out at the absolute earliest stage. Um, and not leaving uh, evaluation and monitoring till the end. But Agile does um, bring with it um, some challenges. Um, people have to work fast and in a highly collaborative way. Um, that can sometimes be difficult in any organisation, and that can be at odds with the organisational culture. Um, that is actually a whole other talk in itself. Um, but I think these projects, like any other projects that are digital in nature, have a habit of being a bit of a Trojan horse when it comes to affecting cultural change. Thank you very much.